introduce myself. I am Iqbal Khan. I am a technology evangelist at Alachi Soft. We are a software company based in San Francisco area. I am personally based these days in Tampa, Florida. So the temperature change has been quite a bit today. Uh, I started from a pretty warm day and came what seems to be a starting of a fall right now. Um, what I would prefer to do is to have this some, a more interactive discussion. Uh, so that as I'm talking, if you guys have any questions, please raise your hand. We'll, we'll talk about it. And, and that will you know, hopefully help me also to focus on things that are more interesting to you guys. Um, so Entity Framework, I know most of you know what Entity Framework is, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But Entity Framework is an object relational mapping engine. Uh, prior to Entity Framework, there's a popular uh, open source uh, object relational mapping engine. Does anybody know what that was or still is? Uh, and, and Hibernate, or, or actually started out from Hibernate and became an Hibernate. Um, even before an Hibernate, um, a few other companies like ours also had uh, object relational mapping products of different strategies. There was this one product called Tier Developer, which is, you know, we don't no longer sell it, it's just free, people download it. But it was a cogeneration or, or a mapper. I just wanted to mention it so just to give you a perspective that I have spent a good chunk of my life thinking about these things. Um, so, um, so OR mapping is essentially, you know, it, it exists because it makes your life easier. You can think at a more conceptual object level than doing ADO.NET programming. Um, it cuts down your development time. It you know simplifies the development, all that stuff. I know uh, you know all of that. And Entity Framework has pretty much become the most popular uh, object relational mapping engine for .NET. And Hibernate was pretty popular, but Entity Framework has taken over now. Um, and Microsoft you know, is pushing it quite a bit. Um, and as it is becoming popular, uh, that, that scalability movement is also being, um, uh, you know, affected by Entity Framework because more and more people are developing uh, scalable applications in Entity Framework. They're no longer just desktop applications. These are ASP.NET applications, web services that uh, need to scale. So these are popular in high transactions. Um, until it, you know, Entity Framework 6.0, you had the, the or which is still, the, the most viable Entity Framework today is still EF6. Uh, the Entity, the EF core is still fairly new. It, it does not have all the features of EF6 yet, although that's definitely the way to go uh, if you're going to continue to use EF. But I'm just gonna talk about EF6, just brief overview. You have a conceptual model, a storage model, and a mapping. Um, and uh, you have an object services layer, which is what allows you to query these objects or make changes and save them. Um, again, my purpose is not to teach EF here, but purpose is to talk about scalability. Um, here's the architectural diagram of Entity Framework, that same thing that I was talking about. You have the, the, all the three models here, and then you have the, um, the o o overall Entity Framework object context uh, broken down internally here. Okay, um, before we go further, let's agree on a few terminologies. The first terminology is scalability. Uh, uh, what is scalability? Scalability, in my uh, uh, definition, is high application performance under peak loads. If your application has super fast performance but only five users, you're not necessarily scalable. It's only when you go to 5,000 or 500,000 users and you still have the same performance, then you can claim that that application is scalable. Um, uh, so which applications need, which entity framework applications need scalability? These are ASP.NET applications. Uh, these are .NET web services. Uh, the, the back end for IoT, which is also usually web services, but I just wanted to put the IoT context in it and any other .NET server applications that you might have. If you're a large organization, you typically have a lot of batch processing, a lot of other uh, server applications that are just processing a lot of things 
um, you know, banks have to do a lot of stuff but b b before the next day starts, they have to process a lot of things. So there's a lot of server applications that come in and, that, and uh, need to scale. Um, I did not put big data into this, I, even though I talked about big data. Uh, the reason is big data is really not a relational database um, concept, uh, at least in practice. Um, and because of that, EF is not really a factor in big data. But it, uh, if you had big data applications, then without entity framework, you would still need scalability the same way, although the nature of the problem is different there. These are all online applications. These, these are like you go to a website, you go to something, or some backend processing is happening all the time. Big data is more of analytics. Sometimes you do it, sometimes you don't. Uh, there are new data that you feed in and keep existing data. So the nature of the problem is slightly different in big data than these. So uh, the scalability problem um, is that, you know, fortunately, the application tier scales very well. If you, if you have written a, a web service or ASP.NET, even if you program really poorly uh, and you do a lot of database calls where you shouldn't be um, making, you'll still scale in a fairly, you know, linear fashion at the application tier. You can add more servers in a load balancer and no problem. So where's the problem? The problem is in the data storage. The data storage, what I mean by that is relational databases, SQL Server, Oracle, any other uh, of the leading databases, or any legacy data, mainframe data. That's your main bottleneck. Um, and uh, I put this statement here called no, no SQL database is not always the answer. Can anybody say why is not the answer, even though it is, it is a fairly scalable database, right? Why is NoSQL not the answer always, the, a database? When you need relational data, it's hard to go between relations. When you don't need documents and stuff, it just makes it harder to get out of I think the bottom line is NoSQL is, would solve this problem if you could move all of your data to it. But can you move all your data to a NoSQL database? You can, you know, technically you can, but practically speaking, you cannot. You have to keep a lot of your business data, your customers, your accounts, your traditional data in a relational database for business reasons, for technical reasons, for integration reasons, for a variety of reasons. So relational databases are not going away. They're, going, they're here to stay. Um, NoSQL is good. You know, we also have a NoSQL product, as you probably saw. It's an open source uh, NoSQL database for .NET called NOSDB. Um, and NoSQL is really good. It's good for new data, for this, this, this loose data, the pictures, the social media, a lot of the less sensitive data that you can put in NoSQL. So for that data, NoSQL will provide you the scalability. But your real business data, which is what the purpose of this application usually is, um, is going to still go to relational database. So that's why the NoSQL database is not always the answer. Um, The solution, of course, is to go, to go with an in-memory distributed cache. Uh, NCache is an open source cache. There is also Redis uh, that uh, you, you've seen in Azure. Microsoft uh, has adopted that. Uh, there are also other caches available. Memcache is another one that is sort of becoming less popular now because of the uh, Redis. Um, and there's also more caches on the Java side, definitely. Um, the benefit of a cache is that it lets you continue to work with a relational database um, and uh, you know, solve the scalability problem. So you can have a scalable application with your relational database or with your legacy database. So how does it do it? How does a, a distributed cache achieve this goal? Uh, can, anybody, can everybody see this diagram? Um, so if you see this diagram, you have the application tier. Uh, usually the web applications or the web services have a load balancer in front, which I have not drawn here. Um, so you have the application tier and then you have the database tier or the data tier. You put a caching tier in between. Um, and this caching tier um, is very scalable. You can add more, as many servers as you want. Just like the application tier, you can add more servers. Uh, you keep a minimum of two servers. And these are sim standard Windows VMs in case of NCache, in case of 
Redis, these are usually Linux uh, boxes if you want to go with a supported version of uh, Redis. Um, but these are standard uh, VMs which are running your cache server. And the cache server or the cache is building a cluster of these servers. So the cluster is a TCP-based cluster usually. Pretty much all caches are building TCP-based cluster. And that cluster means that all servers know about each other. They know how much memory they have, how much CPU they have. They do load, load balancing within the cluster. They, uh, by having more servers mean more memory, more CPU, and more network card capacity. So the three bottlenecks are memory, CPU for transactions, and network card. Uh, if you only had one server, you have one gigabit or 10 gigabit network card, you can max it out pretty quickly if your object sizes are big. You know, especially if your object size is 100, 200, 500K, uh, you put a, a little bit of load, the, Mac, the, the network card is going to max out. But if you have multiple servers, then it will not max out. Same goes with memory, of course, and same goes with CPU. There's only so much CPU power that you can put into one box. Um, so this is, this is the new architecture, you know, that in-memory uh, trend that I was talking about. This is the more and more companies are moving to this as part of their overall infrastructure. So if you are developing any application which is high traffic, high transaction, you not only have a database, whatever that is, no SQL or relational or legacy, but you also build a caching tier. Some people call it data fabric. Uh, the Java folks call it in-memory data grid. It sounds really cool, you know. Uh, but it is essentially a cache cluster. And when you have that infrastructure, you suddenly have a very powerful capability in your hands. You have the ability to store temporary data in this um, and you know, never have to face any bottlenecks. So these, these boxes are not high-end boxes. These are standard dual CPU, quad-core you know, ish type of boxes with two network cards in each box maybe, and 16, 32 gig RAM. You probably don't want to have 100, 100, 200 gig of RAM because the more RAM you have per box, the more CPU you need for garbage collection, for all the other stuff that, you know, the more memory you have in one box, the more garbage collection you have to do, the, high, the, the stronger the processor has to be for it to be. So, you know, the, it's good to have less powerful boxes but more of them than to have a few really strong ones. Um, so this, you know, and I'm going to talk about this more in terms of what you can do with this, but this is the new infrastructure. Again, most of the time, you, these things are things that IT people talk about, not developers. But I'm talking from a developer perspective because you have to program your applications to take advantage of this. If you don't take advantage of this, even if it... it if, even if it exists, nobody's going to use it. There's an API that you have to call. Unless you call the API, nobody's going to use the infrastructure. But if you do call the API, suddenly you're, you, you are ready for scalability. This is a, a, so a minimum of two cache servers, and then a 4 to 1 or 5 to 1 ratio is usually a good practice that we've seen. And we've been doing this for many years now. And about 80% of your traffic it goes to the cache, 20% still has to go to the database, those are the updates. The reads also, the first time you get them from the database and then you do more and more on the cache. And then all the temporary data. The examples of temporary data are session state, view state, uh, page output, it could be any data that two applications need to share at one time with each other. All of that is temporary data that does not need to exist in the database. The only thing that should go into the database is you know, permanent data that should be saved permanently. Everything else should stay in the cache. Any questions? Okay. So, as I said, uh, a, a good distributed cache would give you a fairly linear scalability. These are some end cache numbers, reads and writes. The, the reason the writes are not as fast as reads is because there's re uh, replication happening. So whatever you update in one server, it gets copied to at least one other server. That's why. But still, it's a linear line. Okay. So there are three ways that, as a developer, 
you can benefit from a distributed cache. Uh, and, and today we're going to focus mainly on the first one because that's, that's the only one that comes under the entity framework uh, context. But uh, the first one is application data caching. What I mean by this is you're caching data that exists in your database. So that's your customers, your accounts, your whatever, you know, your, your real business data. Uh, and the main thing to keep in mind in this is that the data exists in two places. One is in the cache, one is in the database. When data exists in two places, what's the biggest concern that anybody would have? Data integrity. Data, data integrity. Yeah, yeah, same. So you want to make sure that the cache never has an older version of the data so that I can't withdraw that $1 million twice from my account, you know, one day. Uh, so uh, the second use is the ASP.NET specific caching. This is, um, again, uh, some of it is also common to web services. Um, and for example, the session state, you can use it from ASP.NET and also from web services. The view state is only valid if you have, if you're not using the latest MVC framework and the output cache. The, the important thing to know about this is that in this case, the data exists only in the cache. It, it does not exist in the database. If that is the case, what's the biggest concern that comes to mind? Uh, again, you're not persisting it. It's all in memory. Volatility, right? Yeah, volatility. So, so the biggest concern in application data is data integrity. The biggest concern in, in temporary data or transient data is that, you know, whether you're going to lose this data because it's in memory. So if that server goes down, you know, your customer was in the last page of that shopping basket or whatever, whatever the business activity was doing, and suddenly he's kicked out as to start all over again. You know, may, you may lose that customer. And if it was a, a thousand dollar purchase, if it, in case of an airline, then, you know, you lost a lot of money. Um, the third common use is the runtime data sharing. This is something that people traditionally did with uh, message queues. Uh, but again, in this uh, highly scalable environment, message queues are not able to scale the same way that a distributed cache can. Now, a distributed cache is not a substitute for message queues for a lot of non-scalable situations because message queues persist data. They go into different geographical locations. But most of the runtime data sharing occurs within the same data center, within the same environment most of the time. And in that, if you have a high traffic environment, it's better to use a distributed cache to do this event-driven sharing pub-sub model. Ncache provides this. Redis also provides this feature. Um, although Ncache has more of it, let's say, the continuous query and the event notifications. Again, same concern. Data exists in only one cache. So that was sort of an overview of what you can do as a developer with a distributed cache, really high level. Um, to take advantage of it. Any questions? Okay. Okay, let's now get, get into entity framework. Um, again, I'm going to talk about EF6 at this time. Uh, I'm not going to talk about EF4. Um, so in the, if, you, if you have an entity framework application and you decided that, okay, I have a high traffic application or I'm going to have a high traffic requirement, let me start using a distributed cache. The first thing, the most important thing to note about a distributed cache is that it is out of, pro it is out of process cache. It is not a cache that, the entire cache does not exist within your application process. Um, so because it is distributed, it has to be out of process so that it, it can distribute to multiple processes. And, and when something is out of process and you have to store an object into it, what does the object have to go through? Serialization. That's the, the elephant in the room, as they say. Um, and so entity framework, uh, you, the main thing that you need to keep in mind is that you are able to handle this out-of-process uh, cache situation. Um, and there are four different places where you will find these problems. So number one, uh, it's pretty simple. When you generate your code, from entity framework, it does not make 
those objects serializable. So your entities are not serializable by default. You have to manually go and do it, or you can go and modify the, the template um, so that the code is generated with this. It's pretty straightforward, but you just need to make sure every entity that is generated by entity framework is serializable. Uh, number two is if you're using POCO, or actually even, even in, in, in case of the uh, generated object, lazy loading, um, when you do lazy loading in entity framework, you're loading a customer and you, um, you don't load all the orders, but until, you know, when you fetch the order collection, all the orders are going to be loaded. When you serialize the customer object, it's going to serialize the customer and all of the orders. And every order is going to have order items. So think uh, Northwind database. Is there anybody who doesn't know what Northwind database is? Um, so in a Northwind database, the, the data model has a customer, which has a collection of orders, one too many, with orders. Every order has one too many with order items. So if you were to serialize one customer, um, and, and, not, and, and you didn't want to cache all of them together, of course, you know, you would unintentionally do that if you did not disable lazy loading. Uh, and you should, uh, the second thing is if, you, if you're using POCO, the plain old CLR objects, um, uh, entity framework to manage these POCO objects creates proxy. Um, and it, it creates proxy to manage, to, to keep track of changes and also to manage lazy loading. So the problem with proxy is that proxy is a dynamically created type. It, it, if, you, if you go into the debug view, I, I don't have the code with me at this time, but if you go into the debug view, you'll see there's some sort of a GUID as the name. Uh, that's only valid for that process. As soon as you cache it, that GUID, next time you try to deserialize, that GUID is not going to be there. So you cannot, you know, you cannot serialize a, po a, 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 po a POCO proxy. Uh, you have to use this proxy data contract resolver class to do this. Uh, the third situation is when you have anonymous types. Here's an example of an anonymous type. You've got a link query where you're doing a join of multiple tables and you're getting back um, a result set that is an, you know, right here. You can't really cache this because this, this is also dynamic. You really need to transform this into some sort of a concrete type. And again, the issues are serialization and deserialization. That's the main issue. So you need to make sure that these four things are taken care of if you're going to use uh, a distributed cache, regardless of whether it's end cache or any other cache. If you're going to use a distributed cache from within EF, um, you need to take care of these. Any questions on this? Okay. Okay. L l uh, now that you've started to do that, let's say you've taken care of all of this stuff, the first question that comes to mind is what should you be caching? Um, you know, there are two types of data that um, I, I, I use this terminology called reference data and transactional data. Reference data are your lookup tables, data that is not read-only, but it's mostly read-intensive. It, it doesn't change as frequently. It may change every few hours, maybe once a day, maybe once a week or something, but it's a lot of reads and not a lot of updates. Um, transactional data, on the other hand, is data that is your customers, your accounts, your activities, the history, you know, the customer called you, you want to keep track of that, everything, all the runtime data, all the data that you would typically not associate with caching because of that fear of data integrity. You would say, well, if I cache my transactional data, I'm going to have data integrity problem because by the time I fetch it next time, it's going to have, you know, it'll be changed in the database. And if that happens, then I'll have the stale data. But you need to be able to cache both types of data if you're going to really benefit from distributed caching because majority of your data is transactional data. And you don't need to cache it for, for very long, even if you cache it for a few seconds. Within those few seconds, you're very likely to fetch it again or want to fetch it again. And if it's in the cache, you'll get it from the cache. Uh, that's the whole idea behind the session object also, that you keep stuff in the session that you're going to fetch 
again. But this data may even be shared across multiple users. That's why session is not a good place to keep it. Uh, you want to cache it directly so that another user might want to fetch it. So if you cache both of this data, only then do you really take advantage. Otherwise, reference data is maybe 20-30% of your data maximum. So 70 to 80 percent of the data is still going to the database, which is, defeats the whole purpose of having all that infrastructure that we talked about. So if, you go, so if you're going to put transactional data, uh, the biggest concern is, oops, sorry. Well, let me just, uh, here's, a, here's an example of what a typical cache call looks like. Let's say you had a load, you, you want to load a customer from the database. You'll first check the cache if the cache has the customer entity. If, if it does, you'll take it. Otherwise, you go to the database through entity framework and you get, a, you, you, you get your customer entity and you cache it. And the key is you know, something that should represent the type and the attribute and the value. It's just a naming convention. You can come up with your own conventions. Uh, so I was talking about caching transaction data. Go ahead. That's something uh, the programmer has to do, check first the cache and then the database, or that, is that something the cache should actually be able to? Uh, no, very good question. Uh, and Hibernate provides a cache provider model. It has an architecture where a third-party cache can plug in, and they have implemented their own logic that at this time, I'm going to first check the cache. If the cache doesn't have it, I'll go to the database and I'll cache it. Their, mo their paradigm has issues. So uh, um, since, and Hibernate is not the topic, I'm not going to go into those issues. But because of that, you as a developer don't have to do any programming. Once you program against an Hibernate, you can just plug in the cache. Entity framework, uh, until 6.0, you couldn't do that. EF Core 1.0 has a cache provider model now. Uh, but as I said, EF Core is fairly new. It, it does not have... Most people are not yet moving to it. But ideally, you should have a, pro a provider model where a cache plugs in. So majority of your, this, this add and get, you can, you, uh, it's done for you automatically. So you just go and get the data from entity framework uh, context. And the context knows, I mean, in fact, even in EF, there is an L1 cache already within your process. Um, so, but it does not extend to an L2 cache. Um, so ideally, it should be done by EF for you, and then something like NCache should plug in. Uh, but it's not there today. Today you have to make the API calls. Having said that, there are some advantages to making the API calls. There's, of course, there's programming involved on your part, but um, whenever you have a provider model, it always is the least common denominator. It has the least amount of functionality because they have to make sure every cache can implement this. So what's the least? It's the get input, that's it, with maybe expirations. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff that you need to be able to do, and I'll, and I'll talk about that, uh, if you're going to really take advantage of a cache. Uh, and they don't do that, and because of that, you are limited, even though it's easier for you, because you don't have to do programming, but you're also, the benefits are also limited. Good question. Uh, so here's what a typical cache API looks like. This looks very much like an ASP.NET cache object API. This is, by the way, an cache API, but uh, other caches have other similar APIs. So you, have, you, you connect to the cache. It's a named cache. You do cache.get. You do get again. It contains add, insert. Insert means add it if it doesn't exist, otherwise update it. Again, insert and remove. So that much you could definitely put in a cache provider. Uh, so if you wanted to cache the transactional data, your biggest concern is data integrity. So how do you, how do you ensure that data integrity is not violated? How, if, you are a, if you're a bank, and you know, we, you know, we have many banks who use our product, and for example, one of our customers, it's a large bank, they have corporate uh, wire uh, transfer application that needs that uses NCache for runtime data sharing. So every cached item could potentially be that corporate wire, which is millions of dollars. So they definitely 
are not uh, uh, going to accept any data loss or any data integrity problems. So if you have, so how do you keep data fresh in the cache? How do you make sure that your data is always the same as it is going to be in the database? Number one is expiration. A lot of caches have expirations. Um, absolute expiration means when you're putting something in the cache, you're saying keep it until this time. So right now it's uh, 7.30 p.m. central time. Keep it to 7.35 p.m. central, uh, uh, October the 13th. Actually what you say is now plus 10. So whatever the now date time is, you add 10 minutes to it or whatever. Whatever time you want to keep it. Uh, the absolute expiration is for permanent data. You do it saying, well, I don't think I should keep this data in the cache for more than this long, whether that's 10 minutes or 15 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever. Because I think for that much time, nobody in the database is going to, nobody's going to update this in the database. But after that time, I don't feel comfortable. So please remove it from the cache. Removing means the cache no longer has it. So then if anybody needs it, they're going to get it from the database and put it in the cache again. So in a way, you're refreshing it. Um, now, in this feature, uh, NCache, for example, would let you combine this absolute expression with another feature called read-through. Read-through is your code that gets registered with the cache. It goes to your database. NCache will call read-through upon expiration. So instead of removing that item from the cache, it will reload the new copy. So the, the item is always in the cache. It just gets updated. And that way, you, you, you can run your queries thinking that all the data is going to be in the cache. Uh, so absolute expirations are for permanent data. Sliding expiration is for transient data. Sliding expiration means um, you're saying keep it in the cache as long as people need it, as, as long as people are fetching it. They're getting it. They're updating it. And at, after everybody stops using this, let's say for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, then clean it up. Like sessions, that's what you do with a session. You, the default is like 20 minutes of inactivity, the session gets removed. So sliding expiration is for temporary data. And it's really more of a cleanup. So although the word is expiration, the goals are very different. Notice the absolute expiration's goal is data integrity. Sliding expression is managing space. Um, usually, you don't use sliding expressions with, with the application data, with data that also exists in the database. So that's the first way that you would ensure that your data is fresh. Second way is to synchronize the cache with the database. So you're saying, well, I really don't know when it's going to be updated in the database. I think I'll expire this after, I don't know, five minutes. But what if it changes before five minutes? You know, I can't really force people not to make changes. And since this data is very sensitive, I really cannot afford for it to go stale. I'm going to synchronize. I want to tell the cache to monitor the database. So there's a SQL dependency feature in SQL Server. Um, that ADO.NET also uh, provides. NCache uses that feature. Uh, you tell NCache and say, this cache item is mapped to this row or this data set in the SQL Server. So NCache now becomes a, a database client. It opens a connection. So it opens a connection with the database. And it, it, it tells the database, here's a SQL dependency please notify me when this data set changes. SQL Server, as soon as that data set changes, notifies NCache, and NCache goes ahead and removes that item from the cache. So that way, it's an event-driven synchronization so that as soon as the data changes in the database, almost instantaneously, you know, with a slight delay, not, nothing noticeable, uh, it gets updated in the cache. So again, uh, you can combine this feature with read-through. So instead of removing it from the cache, you reload a new copy. Um, so a database synchronization is a very powerful feature that allows you to really, as they say, rest assured that your data is not going to be stale. You can cache practically any data. 
there's an alternative to SQL dependency called DB dependency, which is something that we have implemented, but you could implement this also, uh, where this is an event-driven, this is polling-based. So you, NCache would poll every whatever interval you set, let's say every two seconds or five seconds or 10 seconds, and it would poll and, and a specific table if, and, and all the items that were cached that had the DB dependency would have a row in that table. It'll go and say, please give me all the rows back which have, which have the flag modified is true. And it'll get maybe 1,000 or 2,000 rows back. And it'll, in one fetch, go and synchronize one or 2,000 objects, which in case of SQL dependencies, it would have gotten one or 2,000 events, which are .NET events, which are database notifications, actually, so which, are, which are costly, which are which have performance impact. Um, so DB dependency is more efficient than SQL dependency, but it's not as real-time as SQL dependency. Another issue with SQL dependency is that what if you had one million items? Could you create one million SQL dependencies in SQL? You could. SQL would, would not like it, but you could. <laughs> it's going to probably choke. Because for every SQL dependency, SQL Server creates a data structure on the server end to monitor that data set. And it has to monitor that data set. So you know, that's a lot of overhead. So SQL dependency is good if you don't have a million items. If you have thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands, but not on the higher end of tens of thousands. You know. DB dependency is good you know, when you have hundreds, tens of thousands and maybe even a lower end of hundreds of thousands. But even, both of these don't work if you have millions of them. Because even in DB dependency, if you have a true or false flag, the index of 5 million items with some of them true, some of them false, does not look like a very efficient index. Because um, there are only two possibilities, either it's changed or not changed. So then there's a third option, which is you can use a CLR stored procedures within SQL. Um, you, you modify a trigger. The trigger calls the stored procedure, which is a CLR procedure. The CLR procedure makes the cache call. It, and in case of NCache, it just makes NCache call. Um, NCache allows you to make an asynchronous call because that procedure is now ex being executed within a database transaction. So if you don't make an async call, imagine the database transactions are going to start timing out because you've made a call into, so, so just look at this picture here. You've made a call back into the cache cluster that updated one server, and maybe one, one replica got updated. So all of that has to happen within that same database transaction. You know, although it's pretty fast, but not fast enough for a tr transaction. Uh, so I might have misunderstood. Does that mean that you're pushing 100% traffic back down to the database, though, to go check back up to whether it's cache or not? Only for updates. Oh, okay. Only for updates. So whenever you're updating anything, Whenever that customer object gets updated, the trigger in the customer table will be fired. It's going to call the cache the customer cache customer procedure. That's going to take this customer. It's going to create that customer object, cache it. If it exists in the cache, it's going to just update it. That call to the cache should be an asynchronous call, which NCache provides, so that it immediately comes back and says, "I'm done." And of course, if the cache fails, it's going to notify. But the cache does not fail. Uh, like database fails. I mean, database has data integrity uh, violations that can cause a, a transaction to fail, even though the d database is perfectly running fine. A cache does not have data integrity violations, uh, or like a referential integrity or check constraints. Those things that do not exist in the cache, which they do in database. So when you're updating something in the cache, the cache is not going to fail unless it's actually failing. There's some you know, it's out of memory or whatever. Some other real faults are happening, uh, which is mo more of a disaster situation than a data integrity failure. So, yes, a database would be making a call to the cache. Very good question. So, um, in most ca almost all caches do not provide the concept of commit and rollback because it's a distributed cache, so that becomes very costly. Uh, 
because you have to do a two-phase commit then everywhere. Uh, and the reason they don't do it is because, as I said, the cache does not fail usually. It only fails when some infrastructure is failing, you know, which is not something that you really, even for database, that's not why you have transactions. You have transactions because the check constraint failed, or more importantly, the referential integrity failed or something. Uh, in, a, in case of a cache, it's just an object get, that gets put. So no, end cache doesn't have it. In fact, none of the caches do. So if you want to make sure, if you have multiple updates in the database, and then you, so what you do, you update the database first, you commit the transaction, and then you update the cache. If you're, if you're really, if you don't want to cache something un, until the database was updated successfully. Um, Yeah. Actually, uh, you can mix all three. Okay. Uh, for some data, you could do the events. That's as I said, that is real time. For some, you can do the polling, and for other, and the, the CLR procedure is good if you have a lot of data that needs, that is being cached, and you don't want to sync, you know, you don't want to create a copy of it in the database. No, actually, because once, let's say, let's say you have a million items in the cache. And so that means there are a million items in the database. They may be in uh, 10 different tables, right? Because these million items in the cache came from different sources, so these are just items. And in the database, in those 10 different tables, you got different procedures, different triggers. And it's only when you're doing the updates. So, those, so the question is, how many of those items are going to be updated how frequently? It's when those updates are happening, that's when the procedure kicks in, and it's going to go and co make a cost, uh, call to the cache. And the cache is designed because it's a, it's a very scalable cache. It's designed to handle a lot of simultaneous reads, a lot of simultaneous updates, much more so than a database can. So with CLR, CLR kind of Uh, so the, the cache is about 10 times uh, faster than the d database when you do the, the reads and the writes, uh, at least 10 times faster. Uh, there's also there's a client cache, which is 10 times faster than the caching tier itself, so that's like 100 times uh, faster than the database. So that's, that's what I was saying. It's an in-memory store, very fast. The only overhead in this is the serialization overhead. Um, and other than that, cache is, is, is just much faster than database. In fact, one of the use cases that I'm, I was going to, I'm going to get to, uh, which, but I, I'll, I'll talk about that right now, is people use the cache also for, if you want to update something in the database, but you don't want to wait for the database to be updated. And you're pretty confident that most of the time this data is going to be correct. Of course, if it's not, you will be notified. Uh, then you'll just update the cache and let the cache update the database asynchronously. That's, that's called a write-through model. Uh, so, for example, NCache has this feature, but by the, on the .NET side, only NCache has these features. On the Java side, these features exist in other caches also. So there's a write-through, which is the same as read-through, except it writes. You can do a write-behind. The same write-through gets called in an asynchronous manner. So there's a queue. That you just keep queuing stuff, and it just operates on the queue. Uh, and, of course, it handles the updates, it handles the failures. The queue itself gets replicated to more than one server, so if that, because it's all in memory, right? So queue gets replicated, so if any one server goes down, the queue is not lost. Uh, but then you, you just update the cache very fast, and you continue with your operations or your other things, and the database gets updated by the cache. So, so that's another benefit of having a cache, is that the updates are also much faster if you adopt that strategy. Actually, uh, the only limit it has, and that's for both read-through and write-through, is that every read-through call is mapped to one key. Uh, 
Every write through call is mapped to one key. As long as you can map that and underneath that key, it might go to 10 tables and update 10 tables. That's your code, you know. So you wrote that code and cache calls it, gives you the key and the object and says, please save this. Uh, and then you break that object down into multiple tables if you need to and you update them. It, or, or maybe it's just one table. But if in some cases, you don't do the read through because you've, you fetch collections. Let's say it's a join of multiple tables. It's, it's a collection coming back. And you may want to cache the entire collection as one object because you want to only cache it for five seconds. You know, it's because in the next page will, see, you know, as you hit the next on that page, that page will see the same data again. So why go and refetch it from the database? You know, so you're confident that it's safe to keep it for the next two seconds or something. So in that case, you kept the entire collection as one object in the cache. So you violated the, the, the data model, you know. So you didn't, so the cache is not a, an identical copy of the database. Never is. It, it, well, it's definitely not an entire copy of the database, but it's also not an entire, structurally a cache is not identical to the database. It's basically whatever you want it to be. Sometimes you keep the customer object in the database, it's a customer table, and there's a customer object that gets cached. Sometimes you m combine multiple tables into a join and, the, and a collection of that combined object gets stored as individual objects or collections. That's all up to you. And that's, that's the flexibility that you get if you make the API calls yourself. Even, a, even in Hibernate, uh, which I was gonna, which I was talking about, even they, they tried to go too far in trying to do these things for you. And then they came up with a very inefficient model. Uh, because they don't, you know, you cannot, in a generic implementation, you cannot cache the entire collection as one item. You know, it's a data integrity violation, right? You've got a thousand customers, how could you treat them all as one? But maybe your application context, it's okay. In one place, it's okay, it's in other, it's not okay. So that's where it's better to make the API call, put that, a little bit of extra effort right now. It's pretty straightforward API, as you can see. Uh, and then gain a lot of benefit from it. Any other questions? Will you show us some code how write yes. through, read through will look like later? Definitely, definitely. A actually, I, I was gonna, I was supposed to, I got too consumed by the topic, I, I forgot that I was supposed to show you code at every level. Uh, so, okay, so let's say that I'm going to, um, We've got a bunch of samples that come within cache. So let's, let's first take the basic operations. Just wanna show you the. So here's a typical application, .NET application. You would reference a couple of ncache assemblies, the ncache.runtime, ncache.web. You would uh, specify a couple of namespaces and cache again, and cache.runtime and .web.caching. Beginning of your application, you, you connect to the cache. All caches are named. Let me actually now show you the cache. Maybe it's a good time before we go into the code. Let me actually show you what a cache looks like. So I actually have a bunch of VMs in Azure. So I've got two, demo one and demo two are my cache servers, and demo client is the, is the application server box. So I'm just gonna, connect to, let's say, demo client. And I will launch this tool called NCache Manager. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and create a two node cache. It's a two, two node cache cluster. I'm gonna go ahead, I will, all caches are named in case of NCache. I will pick the data format to be binary instead of object. You don't need object unless it's, you're doing it for big data processing. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that at this time. So I, I'll go ahead and pick a topology. Partition replica is a topology which partitions the cache and every partition is replicated to one other server. I'll pick the topology. I will pick an asynchronous replication. If you are very sensitive about your data, let's say that bank with a corporate wire, they will pick synchronous replication so that uh, when you have, for example, let's say 
if the this is a two server cluster server one server two partition one is here and re replica of partition one is here partition two is here replica is here uh, the uh, partitions are active that means the the application talks to the partitions partitions then do they they do their replication and it's by default done asynchronously but if you don't want asynchronous because technically you could lose some of the updates then you, you can choose to do it in a synchronous fashion so that's what i was showing you oops i will pick my first server which is demo 1 I'll pick my second one, which is demo two. Hopefully, you'll see it's so easy to, you know, it's it's pretty easy to do this. I'll just take everything else as the default. Oh, uh, I can also specify how much memory I want my cache to use based on whatever my, whatever my memory consumption is. I've specified one gig here. You will probably have, as I said, 16 gig is the standard memory configuration for each box. Once the cache is full, I can pick one of the eviction policies. I, I'm going to pick least recently used, and I say evict only 5% of the cache. Okay, so that's all I had to do to create a cache. I'm going to go ahead and add one of my uh, application server boxes as the client of the cache. I will go ahead and say start the cache. Now, uh, these, the, these are all VMs in a Azure right now. <coughs> you can come to the statistics. These are some Perfmon counters of the cache. I'm going to now run this tool. It's called Stress Test Tool. It quickly lets you see. Uh, it, it, it connects to the cache and does some reads and writes against the cache so that you can see the cache operating. Uh, you can also monitor the cache cluster into a separate tool called mCache Monitor, right here. So that's how long it took to actually create and run a cache in your environment. So you have now this cache run, running on these two cache servers. The only extra time that would take is, of course, installing the software, which is a, just a standard MSI. And dot seven is your application server box. You will probably have more than one, of course. For a two server cluster, you'll probably have at least four, three to four, and up to eight or so. And then beyond eight, you might want to add a third cache node. And then on this box is where your application needs to run. So I just ran this a, a stress test tool, which is like a test application. So it helps you test the cache without doing any programming. Okay, now that I have this cache, I can co come here and I can say, I want to connect to this cache. So all caches are named. I got my cache handle. So that's the difference between ASP.NET cache where you don't connect to a cache. The cache is within your process. You just get a cache object. But here you, you, you connect to a cache. And you, 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 know, you create your object uh, and you do cache.add here. So I've got a key. I've got a, the actual object, and I've specified an absolute expiration here of just one minute. And I've said don't do any sliding expiration or anything else. That's, that's all I had to do to do a cache.add. Um, what else did we cover? Um, we covered the... Uh, how do you synchronize the cache with the database? So what you do, just kind of quickly. To, to use SQL dependency, again, the same things that we talked about, you have, uh, you do the reference, you reference and cache, you, you get the namespaces up, up here. Oops. You connect to the cache up here. Um, and now, when you want to add any items to the cache, let's say you're trying to add some data to the cache. So 
before you add, you want to cre create a SQL dependence, a SQL cache dependency, which has a connection string to the SQL server, the actual SQL statement. And of course, so this SQL statement represents only one row in that uh, products table. And that row is the product ID that represents this item. So once you add, do, do a cache.add, you have specified this SQL dependency as part of the cache item. That's all you have to do. Once you've done that, and cache knows that it needs to now monitor, uh, it, it needs to tell the SQL server to monitor that data, that data set and notify NCache if that changes. Actually, uh, I think it is n cache, but it, it is based on the same model as the uh, yeah. It, it is n cache. So it, internally on the server end, because again, you're doing this on the client box, you know. So this is going to talk to the cache server. The cache server becomes a client to the database. So the cache server is going to use the actual ADO.NET SQL dependency. And you could also have the cache server use an Oracle dependency if it's an Oracle database. So again, uh, things are very transparent for, for you. So you, you don't have to worry about all the plumbing about where your application is versus where the cache is, where the database is. The cache will connect to the database. You've passed it the connection string. You've passed it the SQL statement. And it'll take care of things. Uh, Similarly, let's see what a read through, write through looks like. So, what, what you do in a read through, write through is you implement this interface called I read through provider. It's an N cache interface. Um, it has three methods. First one is init, which gets called initialization time. When you start the cache, that's when this method gets called, and you specify what these parameters are going to be as part of the cache configuration. These are usually the connection string type of thing. And then there's a dispose, which gets called when the cache is stopped, so that it gives the read through a chance to disconnect with the database. And then this method gets called over and over again. So load from source is, the, is what gets called by ncache when you do a cache.get and the cache doesn't have the item. So you, you tell ncache, say, well, if, if cache doesn't have it, please call read through. So if the cache has it, then it will not call read through. Unless you, you can tell it in cache also, well, even if cache has it, still call read through. But the default behavior is if the cache has the data, don't go to the database because the data is correct. If the cache does not have the data, go to the database um, and, uh, and fetch it. So as you can see, it passes it a key and it gets an out parameter, which is a cache item. So you get to specify all sorts of stuff like expiration and other things for that item. Any questions on the read through? Now this is a code, what you do, you compile this code into a .NET assembly and you and cache manager will actually deploy this code to all the cache servers. So again, everything is automatically done for you. Same thing goes for write through. There's an init, there's a dispose, but in case of write through, there are two write methods. There's a write to data source and there's a bulk write to data source. And the write operation itself, um, as you can see, it is there's an operation type. So there's an add, update, or delete. So when you're calling the write through, you're not only adding data. You could only be also be updating, or you could be deleting the data from the database. Because what if the cache item was being removed, and you wanted the write through to go and remove or delete the same thing from the database also. Uh, 
So, uh, in the exact same way that read through, you implement the write through, you register your assembly with NCache through NCache Manager or, or command line tools, and it gets deployed to all the cache servers. NCache, um, you know, you, you register this as part of the cache. There's a, a provider model where every write through and read through has a, a provider name. So you can have multiple of these so, and call them. And this is, if you want to update multiple, like in bulk. So the right behind is also handled by the same code. So the bulk is specially used in case of right behind when you have a queue, and you can configure it so the queue is updated all in bulk to kind of optimize the right performance. Any questions? I, I don't understand where the data is on this right through or read through. That's your customer object. Is there somewhere in that code? Or? So, I didn't see that. So, okay. So. so let's say in case of in case of write through, hold on. Yeah, so the operation has the actual item in it. Okay. So as you can see, operation dot provider cache item dot value. So, so that gets you that customer object. And then you take that, and now you know what to do with your database. And again, you're passing it from the application. You're picking it up here. It's all your code. And cache is just the, the, the connector in between. Any other? Somebody else had a uh, question. All of them, yes. So this would essentially on that caching tier that we saw this code would exist on all the all those servers because the read through write through is also called you know, depending on what caching topology you use and and I didn't go into that because uh, you know if you use a partition topology or partition replica then whichever partition has that key on that server that's where the read through or the write through executes not on the other ones but if you do the replicated one where every server has the same data, then only one of the server has a uh, read through, write through that executes. And the reason, it, in case of partition topology, the reason it executes on the server which has the data is because you may have, then it, you can run all the read throughs on all the partitions depend, for their own data. And they will all be running in parallel. Go ahead. Yes, so the NCache manager, um, where the, the NCache manager uh, has a feature where you can actually register a backing source. Let me just stop this. Uh, if I were to come here and say stop the cache, So you can come here, you say enable read through, add, you need to say, I don't know, test provider. And you need to now you need to now go and find your assembly. When you add it, then it'll also say what parameters you, you want to pass it for initialization. And when, when you apply the changes, when you have done this and you say apply changes here, it deploys it to all the cache servers automatically. And if, if you're not using the graphical tool, the command line tools do the same thing. So, I mean, all the, this work of sending it to all the servers uh, is done for you. Of course, when it sends it, then you need to specify all the assembly and the, their dependencies and all of that stuff. So, any questions on this? Yes. 
the application. Uh, hold on. I think I have the. The application code is pretty straightforward. You you just do a cache dot get, uh, and uh, you just pass it the key, and then you pass in an option which says the read option is read through. To so say, you know, so it, once you, so it, there's an overload of cache dot get, which allows you to specify that if this item does not exist in the cache, uh, let me actually take you to the documentation. Oops. So if I were to go into the .NET API reference here, uh, and cache, oops, web.caching, cache, So as you can see, here's the string with the read option. So you can you can say uh, ds read option is dot read through. Uh, let me see what the read option is. So what are the possible values? So none or, or read through only. So if you specify read through as as the option here, then ncache will call the read through if that item does not exist in the cache. Did that answer your question? Uh, is there any additional error handling that you say necessary, either on like the application layer or within those read through or write through styles? Yes, all of the all the methods that you call, uh, you you will have the exception handling built into. I mean, so you need to do the try and catch, and you, you need to catch the the exception classes of ncache. I don't know them on top of my head. I'm Thing there, right there. So there's, as you can see, there's a whole list of exception classes that you need to catch for. So there are a lot of stuff that you can. For example, if you do a cache dot add, and the item already exists in the cache, it's going to throw an exception saying item already exists. Um, so you you need to catch that. There are also other exceptions that you need to catch for different situations. But if you're making API calls, that's all the control that you have uh, on the application. Any other question? What's the time right now? How, how much time do we have? We have uh, to 9 o'clock, but... Okay. Let's not go that far, I think. People gonna, so I'm going to continue another uh, five or ten minutes, uh, and then and then we'll do question answer, and that that's the end. Uh, so we've done expiration, we've done synchronization. You, you you can also synchronize with a non-relational source. You can also handle one to many or one many to many relationships, um, or actually one to one or one to many. So if you through a cache dependency feature, where if you add one item, it depends on the other item. Um, and if the other item is ever updated or removed, the first one is automatically removed. Um, so once you start to put a lot of the data into the cache, you need to be able to find it. You can't find it all on keys. Keys is a very unfriendly way of finding data. So especially a lot of the reference data, you want to cache the entire data set into the cache. Uh, and then whatever, t whatever, whenever you've cached the entire data set into the cache, you can use SQL. Uh, and cache provides an SQL searching or, or link-based searching capability. For example, let me just sh show you that right now. So if I were to go into the SQL, 
again uh, you do a select string where this data employee equals this. You could also do something like select customer where customer.city equals Chicago and it's going to give you all the customer objects from the cache uh, that match that criteria. So uh, you cannot do joins but you can do a lot of, you, you can do the wildcard operator, you can do in operator and others. Um, it's a fairly powerful mechanism for searching. And the more and more data you cache, the more you need to be able to search the cache itself. And that, that's where um, a good distributed cache would give you that ability to search. Um, and that simplifies your code. Does the cache implement some kind of indices? Yes. Yes. So uh, in case of NCache, also other caches too, in case of NCache especially, we allow you to index. In fact, we don't even allow you to search on any attribute that is not indexed because uh, cache keeps everything in a serialized form and it would be really, really painful if you had to deserialize every object just to find your data set. So yes, you, you, you can index and that's something that you can do as part of the configuration. And the nice thing about these queries is that they get run on every server and their, their results come to the client box. That means the, the, the client box is your application server and that's where they get merged and then you get the merge results, your application does. Uh, data grouping is a very powerful way. Um, App Fabric also has this feature called tags also, although App Fabric is going away. So um, groups and subgroups, tags, name tags. This is kind of a way to work around the fact that you can't do joins. So these give you logical grouping. So whatever data you fetched, you can tag them all and then later on um, fetch them based on those tags or those groups or subgroups, name tags. So for example, let me give you an example here. Let's say that you had, let's say that you're trying to cache a collection. Let's say you fetched uh, all the customers that were in, in Chicago. And, and this was your entire data set. You fetched the entire data set and you cached it. But you don't want to cache it as one, one item. You want to break it up and cache every customer object separately. And, but later on, you want to be able to fetch it back, right? So now you, you want to say, well, give me that same collection back. So how do you rebuild that collection quickly? You, you assign tags to all of them. As long as they all have the same tag, you can say, give me every object that has this tag. And in one call, you'll get that collection back. So the same thing you can do with groups and subgroups. Name tags is also the same way, except they have a name and a tag. So it's like a key value pair. Name tags are used more, mainly when you're caching text and you need to index it on various attributes. So you specify an attribute name and a value. Multiple attribute names and, and they, all they have values. So grouping is a very powerful concept that you should use. Uh, I hope you're seeing that if you're, you know, that caching is not as simple as just doing get and put. You know, you know it's, it's data. You're building data in, in memory and you need to be able to do more and more database-like things to, to make it really useful. And, and that's where all of this means. So that's why a provider model is not a good idea because it takes you to the least common denominator. We've talked about read through, write through, and write behind. We've talked about the, all, the auto reload items um, for database synchronization and expirations. Um, we, I've just shown you the use of tags for caching every item in a collection. You can do the same if you had a one-to-many. So if you, had a, you cached one customer and you cached all of the orders as one object, but then you create a, a dependency between them. So if that customer is ever updated or removed, all of the orders are automatically removed. Right here. Uh, one more f feature, I think that's going to be our last uh, topic pretty much. Uh, client cache is, uh, as, you know, I was saying that a distributed cache is 10 times faster than a database. Well, a client cache is 10 times faster than a distributed cache. It's, client cache is really a local cache within your application 
server. Ideally, it should be in proc. It should be within the application process. But it is not a standalone cache. It is local, but not standalone. It is connected to the caching tier. So whatever is in the client cache is based on whatever the usage pattern of that client is. That client here means your application. But if that same data or same item is changed in the clustered cache, let's say by another client, this cluster cache notifies the client cache to go and update itself. So the updates are not uh, synchronous. They're asynchronous, but they're fairly instantaneous. The client cache is something that you should use. Um, in case of NCache, the client cache, if you keep it in proc, it keeps data in an object form. So imagine having a subset of the cache on your heap in an object form, but at the same time having the comfort of knowing that this is part of that larger cache. So, and it's a moving window based on your usage pattern. So a client cache is a very powerful concept that you should definitely use. Any questions? Uh, depends on which cache you have. Uh, on, as I said, on the .NET side, NCache is the only one that does it. On the Java side, you have other players who do it too. But NCache has this thing called bridge topology where you can have multiple data centers and the cache can replicate either an active-passive or active-active. You can have one active, multiple passive, or mo more than, or multiple active data centers. And each have their own cache. So each data center has its, its own cache cluster uh, and the replication happens asynchronously. It has to happen asynchronously. You cannot do it synchronous because the distance is so large that it would just kill the performance. And the cache in that case has to handle conflict because you may have the same item updated in both places. Then uh, the conflict is either based on the last update wins. That means whoever updated the most recent gets to win both places. Or it could be content-based, so you can have a, like a conflict resolution handler or your code that gets called, that gets passed both the object and says, which one wins? And then it, it decides. So yes, you can do WAN replication. Um, and, and, and that way, if you're, and in fact, NCache, you know, we've got many customers who have multiple data centers uh, and they use the bridge topology. Some people use bridge, some, some people just use uh, there's a sessions feature that we have which uh, replicates the sessions. But yes. Uh, just one last thing, which was the, the partitioning. <clears throat> in case of NCache, uh, NCache partitions the whole cache into multiple, every server has one partition. So it basically it creates 1,000 buckets. And if you have three servers, you have about one third of that buckets in every partition. And then it, all the partitions created automatically. The replicas also created automatically. Redis also has partitioning. Uh, they also do partitioning and replication. Um, their strategy is slightly different than ours. Um, but partitioning is very, very important. That's what makes it scalable. And replication with partitioning is what you need. So that's our most popular topology that people use. Um, that's pretty much the end of my talk. I, I, I mean, there's more that I can talk about, but I think we've talked long enough. Any questions? Can right. get this uh, slideshow yes, I, 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 will, I will email this to you, and then maybe you can share it with the sure. team. And also this talk, um, I'm also recording this talk, so we're going to have this also recorded and put on YouTube, and, and you know, maybe you can share the link with you guys, and that way you uh, and your colleagues can watch it. Um, uh, NCache does. NCache does. NCache does. It, it does. Uh, let me just t take you to the website. So if you were to go to NCache, come on. There. So NCache does three DAS and AES encryptions. Uh, there is there must be encryption here somewhere. <clears throat>
yeah, n cash does. How does that affect performance? It affects it negatively. <laughs> Act, actually, <laughs> sorry about being a smart aleck here. So, um, <laughs> it's something that you, um, I would say about, uh, there's a 10% overhead on the client end. Uh, but it depends on how big the object is. The, the larger the object, uh, the more costly it, it, you know, it, it is to encrypt. Um, you know, some of our financial industry customers use encryption. Um, again, within, in case of NCash, the encryption is all configuration. So there's no programming for you to do to encrypt. You just configure that whatever gets added to, to the cache by the application, the client portion of it intercepts it and encrypts it in memory and transfers. So that data is encrypted on the client end, shipped in an encrypted form, and kept in the cache in an encrypted form. Uh, so, and then it gets decrypted only within the client again. So there's about 10% overhead, uh, but it depends on the data size. Uh, oh, sorry. Any other question? Did anybody not fill out the card in the back? Because we're, we're going to do a draw right now for that wonderful virtual reality headset, which is much nicer than me, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'll let you pick a card. Yes. You will do total random. <laughs> <laughs> or at least oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the I forgot to bring the, the actual the, the bucket. I'm pretty sure that it's kind of nice. <laughs> okay. Okay, going once, going twice, I'm just going to take whatever is in the center. Michael! There's a lot of Michael that's going to do it. M C R A E. Craig. Give me that. Yeah, we're going to do my phone. Attention. It's the proof. Michael got it. Thank you, everybody.